Because then my wife would help me with this. Now, the way she would help me is she was patient enough to let me explain what my assembly language code was supposed to do. And so I had to say it clearly enough for her to be able to follow it. And in doing so, I would often be able to find error, the errors that I was looking for. This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. In 1987, Bob Ertl's master's thesis was titled Narrowing the Gap Between the Word Processing Needs of Teachers and the Capabilities of Word Processors for Atari 8-Bit Computers. As part of that project, he created a word processor for the Atari 8-Bits aimed at the needs of math teachers. The word processor is called Rewrite, and although he finished it and got his master's degree with it, Rewrite was never made widely available. It was only used by a handful of teachers. Bob has released two versions of the word processor, along with the Mac 65 source code and the manual. I scanned his thesis. All of this is available at the Internet Archive. There's a link in the show notes at ataripodcast.com. This interview took place on July 10th, 2018. All right, so I guess computer education goes back to high school. Uh, I graduated in 1973 from Case High School, the school I eventually taught at. Um, so in the my senior year, 1972-1973, I uh, took a course called Computer Math. And so we had a teletype terminal. We actually had two terminals, but one was hooked up to a phone line so we could run uh, basic programs but in order to do that, we had to type up our programs first on paper tape, and then we would call a computer in Ohio. So we're calling from Wisconsin to Ohio to connect to run our little basic program by having the uh, tape reader transfer our program, and then it it would run and print out on the teletype. And so that was my introduction to computer programming. Uh, from there. I, when I, I went to uh, school at uh, UW Parkside in Kenosha, and so I didn't do any computer work there at all. I just uh, did some, uh, got a ma- um, I got my bachelor's degree in mathematics, uh, teaching certification in math as well. And so I didn't really get any computer education in that process, although I, I guess I did take a physics class where we had to write up our physics labs using Fortran. So there was a little bit of computer programming involved there, but I didn't take any computer courses as such. So when I got my uh, first teaching job, uh, we had an electronics store in uh, our city that I just happened to walk into, and they had a computer on their counter called an Interact. And so that was my first computer. That was that computer ran on an 80 Intel 8080 processor or something like that. And so it was a very very primitive computer, um, but I wrote a few programs on that and used it for, for teaching, uh, it's drilling math facts and so on. Uh, a couple of years into it then, I think maybe it was around 1983 or so, uh, our school district was looking at um, purchasing Atari computers. So that was my first look at Atari computers. Uh, prior to that, we had a professor from the local university bring an Apple IIe out and show us the wonders of that. But uh, our school district ended up going with the uh, Atari 800, and um, and so that was my first look at it. We had a bunch of them to teach computer math with, which was the course that introduced me to to programming. And um, so I, I used the Atari 800 to teach the same course that, that got me started, although we, we modified it and updated it. Uh, you know, from then we weren't calling... Uh, a mainframe computer in Ohio to do our computing. We actually had a whole room full of Atari computers to do programming. So once I got the Atari computer, I basically taught myself programming. Um, you know, I'd look at things in Compute Magazine. Uh, I'd look at, uh, I don't remember all the books I looked at, but mainly I just, you know, used the skills that I had to learn, well, how do I how do I do the stuff I already learned how to do with Atari Basic, and and so that was my that's where I, I spent a lot of time learning programming was with Atari Basic. So we uh, in our computer math course that we taught to our students, we basically in our first semester used the computer as a math tool. So we had them write 
programs to find areas of rectangles, to find areas of circles and volumes and, you know, whatever typical type of math problem you would do using a formula. We had them write programs to input the information, process the data, and, and output the result. But in the second semester of that course, uh, we took it a little further. We had them, you know, most of the students had not taken calculus yet, but we had them write programs that would do a lot of things that um, you use in calculus. Um, a lot of things that were geometric based. For example, in calculus, you find the slope of a tangent line. And so it's very simple with a computer to approximate slopes of tangent lines just by picking appropriate points and, um, and finding the slope through those two points. Uh, another thing that comes up in calculus is areas under curves. And so again, there we just use numerical methods to approximate areas under curves by um, first of all with rectangles to approximate the area and then later with trapezoids. So that was the second semester of our course. Um, we didn't spend the whole time on that during the second semester. Uh, the, the second, uh, I guess the fourth quarter, the second half of the second semester also had the students do a project and most of the projects were to write a computer game of some sort, some sort of game where there's chance involved, strategy involved, and it had to be where the computer played against the person. And so a lot of the things that student, students wanted to do in that regard um, were not done easily just in basics. So they said, well, I wanted to be able to show like a stock market ticker tape scrolling across the top of the screen. So that would not be easily done with basics. So then I got into learning how to write assembly language. So, you know, I could give them, here, here's a little subroutine that will do that. Just put the information you want in the string, call the subroutine, and then it will scroll the contents of the string across the top of the screen for you. Um, what else? In, in the process of, of teaching programming, we decided it would be really nice if we could have, okay, so we had the computer set up with a large television screen, but even with a large television screen, you couldn't really read it easily, you know, much like you can't read what's on that monitor back there right. uh, with, with just normal text. And so I learned about the display list that's used in the Atari and how you can change the antic modes. And so I basically created a normal screen editor, but it used, I think it was graphics two, so that it had really large text. So we could type on the screen and they could actually read it from their seats. And so that's how my interest uh, into assembly language program came about. Another thing that came up is with Atari Basic 2 OS or whatever it was called, you know, you type DOS and now you've lost, you know, either have to use memory save to save your program, which was very time consuming, or you'd lose it just so you could go see a disk directory. And so um, I studied the uh, disk operating system and figured out a way to have it not dump the, uh, you know, the program area when it went to the disk utilities package. So, so I took a lot of things that were there and modified them to, to our, uh, our needs. So that's my programming background um, when I first started teaching. Um, prior to writing the, uh, the uh, rewrite word processor, I did start working on my master's degree, and uh, that was a master's in education with emphasis in what they called computing. They didn't, it wasn't called computer science, it was called computing back then. And uh, so I start this program and they say, well, you have to take all these introductory courses. I say, I already know this stuff. No, you have to take the courses. And so I'd go to the course and the instructor would soon find out that I did know everything they had to teach me. And so they'd say, well, you just write up a little project that does this and then we'll give you credit for the course. So I can't say that I learned a lot in many of the computer programming courses that I took. Um, one exception might be uh, I didn't know Pascal, so I did take a Pascal course. Um, but most of the computer programming courses that I took, I already knew the content. So that, so that takes me up to the point where uh, I'm teaching, I'm working on my master's degree, I gotta come up with a master's thesis topic. So this is around, I think 1980, well, let's see, I'm looking at my master's thesis, it says, that was 87. For, was well, it? that's when it was published, but right. the, the need for this work became available really right around 1983 because 
teachers were starting to use word processors. They were moving away from the old typewriter, and so they were typing up worksheets and tests on their word processors. It was like, well, you know, how do I do an exponent? Or um, how come it doesn't look on the screen how it, it's going to look on my paper? How do I deal with this? And so teachers were coming to me for help on how to use their word processor to generate their their documents that they wanted. And so that's when the need arose because the word processor they were using either couldn't do what they wanted or in order to do it, it was very difficult and it was an involved process that was too much for them to be able to deal with. So I thought, well, we, we don't have the tools. I mean, these word processors are nice, but the people that designed them uh, apparently wrote them for people that want to write articles, not math, math tests. And so that's, that's where the, uh, the whole idea of, well, maybe I should research writing a, a word processor. Now, up to that point, I hadn't really done, um, I hadn't written a complete assembly language, machine language program at that point. I had all these basic subroutines that I could call it. From, from Atari Basic, you could jump into a, a subroutine. And so I hadn't written a program up from scratch that was self-contained completely uh, in machine language at that point. So, you know, it, this this was a big task to, or <clears throat> I'm not sure, I wasn't sure I was able to accomplish this task. I hadn't ever written a, a full-fledged machine language program. And so as I'm thinking about trying to, uh, come up with a way to provide a word processor for teachers that would give them all the things that they need, I ran across this book, the one from um, Charles Brannan. Right, that, Speed Script. Uh, yeah. He, mm -hmm. so he, published by Compute. He basically uh, gave the, uh, the, the uh, machine language code for writing a word processor that would stand on its own. Um, I guess I, should, I just thought of something else. I should back up just a little bit. Sure. Uh, the need for a word processor came up prior to this when I, uh, a couple years prior to that, the newspaper decided they were going to change over, our school newspaper was going to change over from um, using typewriters and I don't know, whatever else they used to create their, uh, their newspapers. They wanted to start using these new Atari computers that we got. And so... Um, and I'm not sure why I got involved in it, but I basic I wrote up a basic text editor where you know I mean it looked like it was nowhere near what SpeedScript could do, but it, they could type in text and then they could uh, manually set the margins they wanted, and then it would print out you know little paragraphs that then they could cut out and paste together to to make their newspaper. Uh, so I, I I had that first attempt at you know this whole idea of word processing behind me in that setting. But uh, when SpeedScript came along, there, I, there I, I, I typed in all the code, and I thought, okay, here's a basic word processor, but there's, there, there's no features. There's nothing here that the, the teachers want. So then little by little, um, as I researched what teachers wanted, I dabbled with, okay, can I make SpeedScript do that? Can I make SpeedScript? And so that's really how this whole thing developed, was uh, then formally researching what teachers needed and wanted, and then little by little making SpeedScript do that. And so it was a rewrite of SpeedScript, and so that's where the, the name came from. And it also, my, my name is Robert Ertl, so R-E, Robert Ertl, writes, you know, kind of had a dual meeting. So it's a rewrite of SpeedScript, speed and, and it was done by Robert Ertl. Awesome. Uh, did you ask Compute or Charles Brandon if this was okay, or did you just run handed? Do it. You know, I that's the whole idea of it being okay. Um, that's why I never pursued trying to market this or do it because I didn't know if it was okay, and I didn't think I thought I was a nobody. And who am I to contact uh, Charles Brandon? I mean, he put his book out there for people to type in. So I mean, it didn't say you couldn't modify things, but uh, so the the thesis wasn't really about writing. A word processor or market it was what it was researching what teachers needed mm -hmm. and establishing that this could be done can you give an example or two of, of what teachers needed that was not available sure uh, I made a, a list of uh, 
of things in my my thesis here. I think I'll just turn to there. I mean, you made and, this uh, chart in your thesis comparing like every word processor and and every feature, and it's it's incredible to look at. It must have been so much work. Well, I'm looking at the the main things that they um, they wanted the word processor to do, and so you know, I mean, even today using using the modern word processor that we have, a lot of people have trouble with this. They don't know how to make the paragraph start with a number and then have everything else um, below it indented. Mm -hmm. You know, and I guess people now call that a hanging indent. I called it an outdent when, when I was doing that because there was, really wasn't a good name for it back then. And so, you know, the, a lot of people would end up typing spaces to try to get the formatting that they want. They didn't, you know, a lot of word processors didn't have tab stops that you could actually, you know, say this is where I want the text to start. And so that was a real simple idea that uh, people struggled with. A lot of the early word processors did not have a scrolling screen. In other words, everything that you typed in was was compressed to your your 40 character speed screen or however many characters would fit on it. So you didn't have what you see is what you get. Um, and so that was a, a difficulty. Uh, another thing is they got confused with, with word wrap. You know, there's it. The, the sentences wrap onto the next line automatically, but there were issues where they really needed to know whether this was a space out here or whether this was just caused by the, the word wrap feature. And so I put in, in the word processor that I embellished uh, the ability to turn the what I called fault spaces on uh, on this screen behind me. I don't know if you can see it, but what's in, in bright green there is mm -hmm. space. There's white space on the paper, but those are not spaces that were typed. Mm -hmm. Those are spaces called caused by the word wrap. Mm -hmm. um, exponents. So in math, you need to be able to put an exponent on a variable. Um, so with a lot of word processors back then, a lot of features were done with by um, using delimiters. So you put a, a special character to say, I want what follows to be an exponent. And then when you're finished with the exponent, you put another delimiter to say, I'm done with the exponent. Of course, that throws off the horizontal spacing. So it was hard to make things line up. Uh, even if you didn't have extra control characters in there to mess up the spacing, it was also often difficult to look on the screen and see if things actually did line up. And so one of the things I put in was a vertical guide bar that could show you exactly um, what does line up. Um, some of the more advanced things that people had trouble with were formulas. Uh, you know, how in the world do I put a math formula in my word process? It's only designed to put text in. So, so many of them were just leaving the exponents and formula pieces out, and then they would handwrite them in after the, the document was produced. Another real simple idea is, you know, back then, in order to make duplicates, we had what were called ditto masters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so you, you needed a printer, first of all, that would print by impacting and uh, in order to make the ditto master. And also you had to go through quite a bit to get this ditto master put in your printer and lined up just right. And so a lot of people had to turn their printer off to do that for each page. Well, many of the word processes were set up where they, they sent the initial control codes to the printer at the beginning of the document. If you turned your printer off for the second page, then the second page wouldn't print right. So, so I gave rewrite the ability to resend the printer codes anytime you want, at the beginning of every page or whenever you say resend it. So that, that was a big issue with, with a number of uh, teachers that they had to turn their print off, printer off between uh, the printing of pages. Uh, the Atari computer, of course, was set up to work with a television set. Many television sets had overscan, which meant you didn't always see the, the left edge of your screen. Sometimes that rolled off the left edge of the picture tube. And so some word processors who didn't have the ability to um, define how much of the screen you wanted to use. So rewrite has the ability to say, OK, I'm not going to use the first two characters because they're off the screen. And um, so that was that was uh, a solution for what some of the teachers were facing. Um, some other things that came up in in writing math tests, you'd often want to have two forms of a test. And so one way to accomplish that is to 
maybe have the same questions, but just rearrange the problems mm -hmm. so that students sitting side by side don't have two, pay, two, two tests that look exactly alike. And so, you know, you just go through the normal editing techniques to move problems around, but then on most word processors, and then you have to go back through and renumber every problem. Well, in rewrite, I gave it the ability to automatically on the fly put in the numbers. So in other words, you just say, I want this these items to be numbered, and when it printed it, it would just increment the numbers, and, and that's what would show up on the, uh, on the printed page. Um, so getting back to the, I talked about exponents having to have a delimiting characters. Um, so with rewrite, I gave rewrite the ability to have inverse video mean anything you want. So if you want inverse video to mean exponent, all you would do is type the exponent inverse video and it would send the control code to make the exponent prior, you know, as soon as you changed over to inverse video. And then as soon as you came out of inverse video, it would send the control code to go back to normal printing. Um, you could define that within the document. So anywhere in the document you wanted inverse video to mean exponent, you would just do that. And so then in that part of the document, inverse video would mean exponent, but then maybe later you want inverse video to mean underline. And so you could change that as much as you want throughout the document so that you could use inverse video to mean anything and then not have delimiting characters. And that way on the screen, everything would line up. Um, rewrite did have the ability to have a scrolling screen. I think I remember right uh, had the ability to have a screen character width of uh, 200 characters, so you could virtually deal with any kind of document. How long did this project take you? Well, we began in you know first I think about 1983. I don't remember when I actually first officially started working on it, but uh, so it was in process from 83 to 87. So. At least four years, you know, four years. I don't know how much of that was. Okay, this. I don't know when I declared my master's thesis. So, but I, I, I began working on it in 1983. Wow. So that's another reason. Once I finally finished it, it's like, what do I do with this now? I used it personally, mm -hmm. and uh, I used it for more than creating math documents. I also used it for another. Uh, classroom program I wrote called, called the Buzzer Game, a team competition game. But uh, I used rewrite to create the data files that were used for that. So I used rewrite for many, many years. But yes. by the time I this came out in 1987, you know there were a lot, a lot of new emerging products that were much better on, on both the Atari and and other platforms. And so it it just, you know, it was a couple of years later I bought my first Macintosh. So it really, it was a nice academic exercise to go through, and and my understanding of computer things today goes back to having to create this this thing. But mm -hmm. it it really was not used by a lot of people because it took so long to get it out there, and then there were other things that were were better that mm -hmm. were available by so, that time. So, how many people do you think actually used it? I mean, a, a dozen teachers. I'm just guessing. <clears throat> so I think it's a dozen or less. Um, I had two brother-in-laws that were struggling with word processors to write up their uh, graduate work documents and so on, and I got them going on it. Teachers at school, I had maybe eight of them start out with it. You know, they had already invested four years in another word processor that they knew real well. So, you know, I don't know how much they used it. I, I took them through a, an introductory course on how to use it, and they used it for a while. But again, you know, some of those same people were along with me buying their first Macintosh computer yeah. uh, just a few years later. So I don't know that it was very many. I think it, it, I think it's no more than a dozen. Wow. Totally. Was this one of those situations when you're done with the project, you have to go stand in the room and defend your thesis? Yes. So I had to bring my Atari computer. Um, so I had to defend two things. I had to defend the research that I did in terms of documenting what teachers needed. And then I had to 
illustrate all of the features, you know, that I said were important on the actual word processor that I wrote, the rewrite. And um, I don't remember if there were other aspects that they had. So I think it was the research of identifying what was needed and then to illustrate that I actually accomplished uh, satisfying the need. Yep. When I contacted you after having found your, your thesis and, and read it, you said uh, uh, that you had the source code. I was just like, oh, will you please send me the source code? I'll see if we can get it. And you not only did you have the source code, you still have an Atari computer. You got it all off there. You clearly still use and know how to understand your Atari after all this time. Um, do you, So tell me about that. Well, I did have to clear out some cobwebs on dealing with assembly language and and remembering how all that worked. Well, first of all, I had the I had a printout of the uh, assembly source code of I think it was version 2.5. I I didn't ever print out the final um, version, the uh, 3.1, mm-hmm. at at that point in time. And so I had the printed copy, and I had carefully, you know, saved several copies on floppy disk, and had put them away hoping that, you know, they would survive. But, of course, I know that, you know, that type of medium does not last forever. And so um, when I went to that medium and tried to load it, uh, some of the disks worked, some of them didn't, some of the files loaded, some of them didn't. And so I was like, okay, I guess I don't have it. But then, you know, I contacted you, and you gave me the the technique for recovering uh, data on such disks. And it wasn't so much that the data was lost, it's there's crud growing or uh, building up on the disk that had to be washed off. And so after washing each disk carefully, I was able to read it, which was just amazing. Um, So then, you know, working on an Atari computer and then being able to send you like the electronic version of the source code, I mean, that's the the source code doesn't fit all on one floppy disk. So uh, I did have... Uh, something called an ape interface, which allows the Atari computer to connect to a, a PC. It's really just uh, connects the serial port on the uh, PC to the SIO port on the Atari, and then there's software that, to go with it. But I had like one of the original versions, and they hadn't gotten out all the bugs out of the the uh, software at that time. So when I cre- uh, t- told my assembly language the Mac 65 assembly language program to uh, print the source code over to uh, the PC, it would every so often send uh, an inv- a character that didn't belong. And so uh, that was kind of, you know, I didn't quite know what to do with that. So I worked with that for quite a while, and I like I would do it three times, and I'd use it. Uh, text compare program to see where they differed and then uh, was able to come up with a clean copy but it then it finally occurred to me well why not I contact the company to see if they you know maybe they probably fixed this by now so they did send me the latest version of their software and it you know its first attempt was a perfect match for my cleaned up copy so uh, that that's how I pursued it beyond that but um Another thing that was kind of mysterious as we were going through this is after I got the assembly language up and running on the computer, you know, I had, since it doesn't all fit on a floppy disk, uh, I used a RAM disk and I have two different types and I couldn't remember how they worked at first, but, you know, um, so I had a uh, Axelon RAM disk for the 800 and I had a RAM disk in one of my 800XL computers. And so I eventually figured out how both of those work but I primarily used the 800XL. But when I assembled the program, the size of the object file that I created wasn't the same size as the one that was on my my previous floppy disk. So that was a, a real mystery for a while. How come the assembly language program that I'm doing today, which is exactly what I used the last time I created it, isn't giving me the exact same file? And then, then after many weeks of contemplating this and trying to figure it out, I remember that I gave rewrite the ability to save itself. So in other words, you could set various settings the way you wanted them, and then you could say save word processor. And so it would save not only the word processor, but all of the data area that the word processor used uh, for settings. 
And <clears throat> so when you originally assemble it, it just saves the word processor and it sets um, room aside in RAM for those settings. But when you save, when you have the word processor save itself, it saves not only the word processor, but all of the settings. So that made a, a slightly larger file. So that was the, the only difference between the two files. So the, the copy that I had saved on floppy disks was one where I had it save itself with settings the way I wanted it. Mm -hmm. So that's why it was larger than the freshly assembled one. So uh, a few other thoughts about things that teachers wanted that they, they didn't have uh, came to mind. Um, some of the word processors, you know, as I already mentioned, would not show you on the screen exactly how it was going to look on paper. And so that was a difficulty. But some of them did show you how it was going to look. But you couldn't, you had to set it up however you wanted it for the entire document. And so everything had to look the same. And so if they wanted the first page to be different from the second page, that what they, they'd have to use two separate documents. Whereas in rewrite, you could put page format parameters anywhere in the document. And any time it got to those new parameters, it would it would use those. Moreover, you could have it so that whenever your cursor landed on one of those lines, it would automatically read those parameters and then adjust the screen accordingly. So that as you move through the document, as soon as you got to the new section, it would it would shift how it put things on the screen so that it was displayed correctly. So that was a, a big issue. Is uh, teachers were frustrated by the fact that what they saw on the screen with many word processors did not look like what was gonna happen on paper. And it was difficult for them to just imagine, you know, uh, how it was gonna look, especially if you want to line things up in, in columns. Mm -hmm. it, it was very difficult to do if the screen didn't show it that way. Um, formulas, so I mentioned that, you know, word processors initially weren't designed for formulas. So uh, at that time, the the main printer that was available, one of the most popular printers was the Epson MX80, and then later the Epson FX80, and I'm not sure what the F stood for, but I do know that it had programmable fonts, so maybe that's what the F stood for. So in that manual, I read how you could uh, send a file to the printer to generate you know, the fonts that you wanted to use. And so at the same time, I was learning how to change the fonts on the uh, the Atari computer on the screen, and so I created you know a math font for both the screen and the printer. So then you could you could create formulas. Now you know it's nothing like we have today, where you know there, there's drawing capability. Basically, I redefine characters to have different shapes, which you could then piece together like a puzzle to create a formula. Like you, if you wanted a square root in your formula, you'd have to have all the different pieces for the square root character, and then you'd put the pieces that you wanted underneath. So um, one, of the, one of the things also that I did with exponents when I, when I got the fonts is I created uh, char characters so that they already were exponents when you type them. So in other words, you could type an equation and just use the special character for an exponent of two or the special character for an exponent of three to like type in a, a polynomial expression. You didn't have to use the printer commands to generate an exponent. You just had a, uh, a character that already was an exponent character. Awesome. Um, can we talk about the buzzer game and any other projects that you did uh, with the Atari? Buzzer game had something to do with you created buttons that connected to the joystick ports and then people could buzz in when they knew something? Right. So the uh, the program would not... So, so this is a team competition program where you have two different teams in the classroom competing against each other. Uh, I mean, two would be the fewest. Uh, I actually made it so you could have up to eight uh, teams competing in the classroom. So the, the program that I wrote, the buzzer game that I wrote, team competition program, would put a question up on the screen that you would have to type in ahead of time. And then, you know, that's in like graphics two so that they all can see it. And then down in the, uh, the four line graphics zero text area, that, that's called graphics zero, right? The, yes. the normal text screen. Mm -hmm. I think there's four lines of text that are available in a, in a normal graphics um, 
for screen, it would have the answer. And so to use this program, you know, you'd have a large screen TV, but you would tape a piece of cardboard over where the answer shows up. But then you have a separate monitor connected with the same, you know, composite video cable to the teacher's monitor, which then does have the answer up there. And so <clears throat> I... Uh, the joystick port is just a bunch of switches. So when you push the joystick up, it connects two wires together on the joystick port. When you put the joystick down, you get two other wires connected together. Um, and I think each joystick port can handle two joysticks. If, if No, that's not quite right. One so joystick or two paddles. Per so was it two? Ch okay, so somehow there's eight... There's eight switches on one joystick port. I don't remember exactly why that is because on one joystick you just have four wires plus a fire button well anyways there are eight possible things uh, mm -hmm. wires that you can detect being connected to the uh, a, a, th a third wire or whatever so there's eight different switches that you can monitor on one joystick port so no that's not right I had t I used two jo joystick ports so on each joystick has an up down left and right so that's four switches right plus the fire and so and but I, I didn't use the, the fire okay. well, I used the fire for them to test to see if their joystick was working but hmm. so I had I had two sets of uh, s switch buttons so so uh, I back in the old Kodak days with 35 millimeter film they all came in these little plastic uh, Containers, so that's that's what the switch uh, handle was, and then I bought some buttons to put in the on the lid, and then just had speaker wire running over to the the, the um, plug that plugged into the joystick port. So I had four switches connected to one port, and four switches connected to a second port. So each team then had an on-off switch in their hand. So the way that worked is a question would come up on the screen. And then the, the computer is monitoring through a display list interrupt. I think it's either 30 or 60 times a second to see if somebody's got their button down. And if a button is down, it logs who got their button down first. And then a timer comes up on the screen and they have that. You can set the timer to whatever you want, but the timer starts ticking down and they have that amount of time to get the answer completely out of their mouth. And then... I compare that with the answer showing on the screen, and I, on the keyboard, just indicate whether that's right or wrong. And if it's right, <clears throat> the way the program was designed, if you had eight teams and they got it right on the first try, they would get eight points. And so um, if they got it wrong, you could specify how much of a penalty that was. I typically would have them lose half the, the question point value. So if they got an eight-point question wrong, they would lose four points off their, off their team total. And then the value of the question drops down to seven points, and whoever has clicked their button in the meantime, their team name comes up on the screen, and then they can answer the question. And so uh, if you have eight teams playing, that you can have eight wrong guesses before, before you finally uh, give up and, uh, and uh, discuss the question. So the kids really like that. They learned a lot, and we used it for reviews for uh, semester exams typically, but I used it at other times as well. Um, so th the idea is rewrite what I was used in order to create the data file that would have all the questions. And since this is, you know, I'm a math teacher, I used rewrite's capability to create formulas using the, the fonts that I created to puzzle, uh, piece things together. So I could put equations up on the screen and ask questions about it. And so, uh, that was used for many years. Uh, I think I haven't used it in the last four years probably, but up until four years ago, I was still using it in, in teaching it. It's kind of wow. kind of interesting, you know, here I'm bringing out this old 8-bit computer, and, and yet, you know, it, it could do things that, that were remarkable, like it could check whatever it was 30 times a second to see if you had your, your uh, buzzer button pushed. Right. And, uh, so as far as other things that I've done, yeah. uh, I, again, we, we taught, I taught computer programming, computer math, uh, with the Atari for many years. And um, so I already mentioned the two things. Uh, <laughs> the program that used a graphics four screen to uh, let you use it as if you were on a, a graphics zero screen um, was a program I just called Big. And it was, it was a, that 
that, uh, well, it was not a complete machine language program, but I used BASIC to set up a custom display list. And then uh, I had to, I don't remember all the details of what had to be done, but you had to somehow tell Atari that, hey, you don't have the, in oh, no, we did, we did leave the whole screen available. So then because you're taking, you know, whole screen and only showing half of it with large letters, then it was vertically longer than than what you could see. So then we used the uh, start and option button to scroll up and down it. So and then uh, the cursor. So how do you get the cursor to show up? Because in graphics, and I'm getting my numbers mixed. Yeah, graphics up. Maybe two or one don't don't show a cursor. Okay, so that's yeah. what I'm saying. Graphics four, but I don't I don't know why. So two and one they don't show a cursor. So right. then. Okay, got player missile graphics. I had to figure out how that works and do the math to calculate what the coordinates for the player missile graphic rectangle should be compared to where the cursor currently is um, on the screen. So we did have a, a cursor, but it was a player missile graphic cursor. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So did you, I want to get, I think we glossed over something. Did you say that up to just a few years ago, you were using an Atari computer to, play the game on, on very rare occasions yeah. <laughs> in recent years i would i, I would tell uh, i mean i retired from teaching in racine unified school this where I was for 34 years i retired in 2011 but since then i've taught at a couple other schools and so just for fun i would say you know i got this old atari computer and we could i could bring it in to do a you know a review so um four years ago i i still did that but i haven't done it in the last four years hmm. Um, kind, of a, kind of a nostalgic thing, sure. <laughs> but yet it's you know it still served its purpose. So. Did you do any other Atari projects or programs, either for well, for I work I, or for I wrote a lot of software. I, I wrote a lot of uh, machine language subroutines that are routinely used in other programs that I wrote. Uh, so what was the first big thing that I wrote as a teacher? Um, grading programs were just coming on the scene after computers came out, but you know they were slow to to work just like you wanted them. So I wrote my own grading program uh, so I could keep student records on my Atari computer. Um, what else? There are a lot of math programs that I wrote. So one of the things that we did in computer math too, I said we, you know, we explored various calculus topics, but we also did it in a graphical sense. So uh, I taught the students how to um, basically put a graph on the screen. So in other words, you've got X and Y coordinates on paper where the origin is often at the center and negatives going left, positives going right. But then you've got a screen where the home position is in the top left corner and that's zero, zero. And the, the Y coordinate um, positive takes you down and the X coordinate takes you across. So there's a transformation there you have to figure out. How do you change graph paper coordinates into screen coordinates and then reverse the process, change screen coordinates back into graph paper coordinates. And so <clears throat> in the process of having them learn how to uh, come up with estimates for slopes of tangent lines and areas under curves, it was also done visually where they would have the computer draw the graph on the screen. And then when it found the slope of the tangent line, they had it draw in the tangent line and then put the, the, the slope of that tangent line on the screen. Or if they're finding areas under curves, when it, once it came up with the area, then it would color in the area under the curve. So essentially, before Texas Instruments came out with their TI-81, we were, we were doing all that stuff on computers, and then it all disappeared when the graphing calculator came out. Cause, huh. Well, then, we, then our computer math course, we, we taught them how to uh, program the graphing calculator, but that's another topic, so... Huh. So our computer math two course, our uh, fourth of the year, we were basically having them build a graphing calculator. Is what it amounted to. That's really cool. Well, Thanks. So and I, I used a lot of the things that I learned in a numerical, um, what was it called, numerical methods course in college. You know, and there we didn't do it. We didn't have the the graphical component. We were just crunching data and coming up with answers. And so it was interesting because the professor that I had for that course um, had a child at our school. And so he came out there for open house. And I said, 
I, I, I saw him. I didn't have his, his child. But I said, I want to show you what I did with your numerical analysis course. <laughs> and so he, he, he got a good uh, chuckle out of that, that um, where we had taken that, you know, just number crunching into actually a, a visual display of what was going on. So that was neat. Neat. Um, well, there's, you know, a lot of other things I did just as teaching tools. You know, I did teach calculus, so, you know, in that course you're finding volumes and surface areas and so on. And so sometimes it's hard just to visualize the uh, three-dimensional object that you're working with. And so I <clears throat> learned how to, you know, project three-dimensional coordinates onto a two-dimensional plane and wrote a program to to you know be able to illustrate the uh the shapes that we were finding the areas and volumes of and at that time there, i didn't know of anything that was available like that to uh you know to purchase um well you know, you buy an atari computer and you certainly learn learn that the disk drives were not real reliable so i wrote a and and one of the reasons was the uh the speed would sometimes get off. I can't remember. Was it, was it supposed to be like 288? I RPM? believe that's right. Yeah, I believe that's correct. So I wrote a program to read a sector, read a sector, and see how, uh, you know, so I could use it to adjust the speed. And, and that seems, time solves some problems. Uh, what else did we do? I'm sure. <clears throat> You know, it's basically what do we need this machine to do or what problems are we having it? And that's what drove, you know, the next program that I wrote. Um, choosing colors, wrote a program so you could um, pick the color you liked and then it would give you the parameters for that color for your uh, color statement. Um, sounds. Oh, here's another thing we did. Okay, so Doppler effect. Um in, in calculus, we did something called related rates. And so that just means that if you know how one rate is changing, you can, pre you can calculate using calculus how other rates are changing. And so one of the rates that uh, I use the Atari computer to explore in a real-world setting is the, the change in pitch of a car horn as the, or a train whistle or whatever you want as the... Uh, car is approaching you and then as it it's moving away from you and so when i taught that i i point out that when you do that problem in physics class in high school physics you uh do it as if you're standing in the roadway in the pathway of the car and so you just have one pitch as it's approaching and a different pitch when it's going away and i said that's not really a, a safe way to explore this and so <laughs> if you stand off the roadway then you have a constantly changing pitch as the car is approaching you in a constantly changing pitch as the car is going away so so i had my wife uh, go with me out on a lonely roadway and we recorded the sound of a a horn as she sped by at 45 miles an hour and and then we uh did all the math and had the atari computer generate the same sound and then uh played them together to show that it was uh, an accurate uh, description of the real world so wow <laughs> So the sound, uh, I, I've never, you know, I've, I've wanted to uh, update that, do that on a PC or a Mac, but I don't, I don't really know how to control the sound as easily as I did on the Atari. You just, you have a sound command, and there you go. Yeah. But, uh, so I've never written that program on any other computer. <laughs> um, All right. So in my research, I. I came across a couple of things, and you can tell me if these are, are relevant to you. Um, was Are you related to a Bernard Ertl who wrote a couple of programs for Analog Magazine? I am not aware of any connection there. Okay. Um, is the spelling the same, E-R-T-L? Yeah. yeah. I, I, never, I never saw his name. <laughs> I didn't know such a person existed. Okay. Um, <laughs> A Bob Ertl in 1984 had a computer stolen with a value of $1,364. Was that you? I did have my my house was broken into. Hmm. I had uh, I did have a computer stolen. Hmm. Wow, that's out there, huh? 
It's in some newspaper somewhere. Was it an Atari or something else? It was an Atari. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want the story. What happened? Well, I, that, that's about it. I mean, we, <laughs> we left. Our house was broken into. They took a Atari computer, some stereo equipment. Uh, it was never... We never found out who it was. Uh, we, we upped security measures on our house, had put in lights that would come on when we weren't there. We put bars on the basement windows. Um, and... Nobody stole computers after that. <laughs> Clearly, you got another so, one. <laughs> so, there, yeah, the insurance company took care of it, and okay. And they were, I think I lost a modem in that in that, that theft too. <laughs> yeah, that's a, there, there's not much to tell in that story other than somebody broke in and took it. Oh so. man, they got a nice computer, I guess. Um, <laughs> cool. So, what do you do today? So I, I started teaching in 1977. So I've taught math, computer science, uh, computer programming, which I alluded to. Uh, you know, we've gone on to other platforms since then. Uh, you know, so, so the last time I taught computer math was probably 10 years ago. We were using Visual Basic on uh, PCs. Um, so I haven't taught computer any computer science related things uh, probably in the last 10 years. But uh, I'm still teaching math. I, I retired officially from Racine Unified School District in 2011, but I haven't stopped teaching since. I've uh, taught at uh, two other schools since then, and I'm I'm still at it. So I'm not sure when I'm going to retire. I'm uh, someday soon, <laughs> but at the moment I'm still teaching. And I say I haven't taught computer science, but just about every school I'm at, there has come a need to use. Uh, the abilities that I have to get the data that we need. Um, so, what 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 are some of the examples? So, in just about every school I've been at, they have a um, some sort of student records program that computes GPAs. And at every school I've been at, we've always found how it's coming out with the wrong answer under certain circumstances. Uh, just to give you a quick example, one of, one of the schools I was at, it was leaving out the ninth grade gym class grades from the GPA calculation because the grade level was typed in as nine instead of zero nine. And so, you know, in, in each case, it's some bizarre thing that has ca caused the system to not calculate the GPA correctly. But... Um, there's always been something. So most recently, I was at a, a school where, where this came up where we weren't clear on the, the GPA. So um, what we worked from is that we had the ability to print out st student transcript, okay? And then, and then you could manually go through and, and try to see what the GPAs are. But because of all the work I did on an Atari, especially with Atari Basic, where I learned how to, you know, pick out the pieces of data that I needed using the various... <clears throat> string handling um, formulas and stuff. I'm very comfortable with writing software today where I can say, okay, let's output the student transcript as a PDF. Let's copy the text into a text file. And now let's see if we can reliably read that text file with a, uh, a computer program. And then let's calculate the GPAs from their, from their transcript independently from how <clears throat> the um, student records program is doing it. And so, so this couple of years ago when I did this at, at the school that I'm at now, and I was asked, could I just check a couple of GPAs, you know, of the top students? So I said, well, how do you know which students are the top students if you're not, if you don't have the right GPAs? I mean, you, you don't really know. Maybe there's a top student whose GPA is being calculated way off and you're, you're going to miss them. So, so like a two or three day process where I wrote up this program that would you know, crank, crank, I'd cranked out all their transcripts uh, as PDFs, copied the text into a data file, had the program read their GPAs. So three days later, I hand the guy a printout of um, every student, every senior student's GPA. So, but I attribute, you know, the ability to do that to all the work I did with working with strings and, and this whole idea of working with a word processor, how you can, uh, you know, wade through a, a huge file and and search for things and, and pull things out. You know, like the, the search and replace routine you wrote right for the word processor, same, same kind of techniques you use to kind of reverse engineer a printed document or a, 
a data file document that I described to look for key things and then extract the the data that you need. So, so a lot of the things I did with the Atari uh, have have paid off, you know, through mm. all my life. I, I would say. Excellent. Do you remember when you were doing rewrite any thing that was particularly tricky or difficult, or you just had to uh, give up on because you didn't know how to do it? Right. Yeah. There's there's a few things I didn't implement that I that I maybe could have, but other things that I really didn't know how to do. Um, so one of the things I didn't rewrite was to speed up the auto repeat, and I, I kind of did it in a backwards way where I just kept changing what was left on the timer so it would count down quicker than it was originally programmed to. <clears throat> so the auto repeat, you know, I, I was able to do, but uh, something similar is the I never came up with a text buffer or a, a keyboard buffer. So in other words, if you type too fast and rewrite it won't get you you'll lose characters uh, especially if you have it in insert mode where you're pushing all the text away one character at a time as you're typing you know it won't keep up with you so uh, a keyboard buffer would have been nice another thing that I didn't implement because it wasn't really a big deal in math documents but uh, some of the early printers had what they called proportional spacing where W's then would be wider than the letter J or the letter I. Um, I didn't take that into account. Uh, I designed, you know, on the screen, uh, the characters are all the same width. And so I just, I never explored the math that would be involved with, with dealing with um, uh, using proportional print characters and making that all work out. So all of my alignment things in rewrite assume that every character was the same width. So uh, it was just much simpler, and I didn't see the advantage of, of going to all the work to, to being able to deal with proportional width characters. Uh, what else did I not do with rewrite? Um, there, there's a bug in rewrite that I've never been able to figure out. It might have something to do with speeding up the auto-repeat rate, and that is every so often it'll just start repeating the same character over and over and over. And the only way to get out of that is to hit the system reset. Um, you don't lose anything, but uh, you'll just have a, it'll just repeat over and over and over and it won't stop unless you hit system reset. So I don't know what's causing that. Um, Well, of course, as I use more modern software now and generating math formulas is, you know, it's done completely differently. You don't have to put puzzle pieces together to generate them. Uh, that would have been nice, but I don't even know if it would be possible on an Atari to, to generate that kind of printer output. Um, what haven't I asked you about that time that I should have? <laughs> Well, at that same time, I got married, uh, and so it was kind of interesting because then my wife would help me with this. Now, the way she would help me is she was patient enough to let me explain what my assembly language code was supposed to do. And so I had to say it clearly enough for her to be able to follow it. And in doing so, I would often be able to find error, the errors that I was looking for. In other words, I would explain to her what I was supposed to do, and then I would explain to her how it would do it. And it really didn't matter whether, well, it mattered that I had to work hard to try to get her to understand it, but in the process, then my ear would be revealed. And so <laughs> um, she also helped me with writing up the thesis. Her grammar skills are much better than mine, so, <laughs> so that was helpful. Nice. I think, um, anything else? I, that's all that comes to mind. Okay. I think this is my last question. Um, if you could send a message to the Atari computer users who still exist, and you can right now, what would you tell them? <laughs> well, I think it's, uh, what would I say to them, to the Atari users? What? Well, <clears throat> I guess as I thought about this, I, 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 it, 
this is going to be a kind of a roundabout way to answer your question. But as I thought about this, I was thinking I should write up or create a video to show people how to use this word processor and so on. And then I, reality said it like nobody's going to use this to actually as a word. It's kind of a novelty and fun thing to look at, but nobody's actually going to use it. So I, I kind of lost that motivation. But I think to the rest of the world out there that hasn't experienced Atari programming, you know, it's it's like we've we've lost uh, something that was so motivating in in my younger years. I mean, I would be at the keyboard programming, and the sun would go down, and the sun would come up, and another day would take place, and I hadn't gotten a, a bit of sleep. And uh, and so for the the people that are out there that have never experienced that, it's like. How could anybody get so interested? But what about the Atari users out there? I don't know really what to say to them other than uh, I hope you enjoy looking at this Atari word processor, but I don't expect anybody to actually actually use it as a word processor. It's just kind of interesting that this, you know, such a thing existed. But I, I don't know if I have any real words of wisdom beyond that. No, that's fine. That's great. Thanks, Bob. This is perfect. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. If you enjoy these interviews and would like to contribute, there are two ways you can help. You can help fund these interviews directly by contributing to my Patreon. A small monthly contribution will help offset the expenses of making these oral history interviews. Contribute at patreon.com slash savits. Or make a tax-deductible contribution to the Internet Archive, a nonprofit digital library that has done incredible things to preserve computer history. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org slash donate. Thanks.